I hate pro football. It's too rough and too fast. And all the players dress like Star Wars. Let's leave ice hockey to the other pros. That game's a little too rugged. these values and that's why our firm has been a proud sponsor of the first tee nationally. Tonight's MC, Mr. Michael Barkan. Michael is the most active and to me the most entertaining sportscaster in Philadelphia. He's, he's been recognized as, the, as Pennsylvania Sportscaster of the Year an incredible seven times. He brings five Mid-Atlantic Emmy Awards and as well as a great deal of national sports reporting experience to Comcast Sportsnet. In addition to hosting Daily News Live and Post Game Live with the Gov, as he says, Michael also provides reports for Sports Night. His work includes reporting for CBS Sports from, from the Olympics, as well as from the U.S. Open Tennis Championships for USA Network. Before joining CSN, Michael worked as a sports anchor for WLVI-TV in Boston and here in Philadelphia at KYW-TV. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Michael Barkan. Thank you, Ed. Just like I wrote it. Just like I wrote it. Get your pins here. Get your pins, 1995, it's as low as I'm gonna go for the pins for the first tee. I'm gonna leave it right here. Maybe we'll auction it off a little bit later on. You know, I, I was 
thinking we were talking sports before, and I thought, you know, someone was asking me about the Philly score today, and I, I said, I said they lost five to two. He said, no, 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 not the Philly score, the golf score. I wanted to know the golf score, so I forgot. You know, we're sitting with a bunch of golfers here, of course. I apologize. So we've got Adam Scott and Hunter Haas atop the leaderboard. Twin 66s and uh, four under par today. Defending champ Justin Rose and even 70. So we'll see what happens. But I am, I'm thrilled to be here. And, um, you know, I see that the, we got uh, the president uh, of, of Aronim Inc., Joe Brooks, Harry Hill, the Mar Marion president. We're going to have a little rumble a little bit later on and kind of... <laughs> I think that's going to be good. Um, I hope you get the chance to talk to some of the first T kids. I, I don't know if you have, but I was talking to, to four great kids earlier. I don't know if they're around. Pat, Pat, raise your hand right there. Great kid from South Philadelphia. Nate, where's Nate? Where's my man, Nate? There's Nate right there from North Philadelphia. That's Nate. Where's Megan, who's graduating? There's Megan from Temple University right there. She's going to law school. And where's Zaki? Where's Zaki? There's Zaki. Zaki, put up your hand right there. How you doing, Zak? All right. Some of the first T kids, it's, it's amazing. And, and just to talk to them, I hope you all get the opportunity to talk to them and what the, the folks at First T are doing in enabling everybody to kind of get a, a better chance at life through teaching golf. And I love the par, birdie, eagle concept. It's fantastic. So um, thank you very much for, for being here tonight. We've got to get to our conversation now with our very special guest. And um, we had him on Daily News Live tonight. Uh, and we just we asked them everything. So you're left with what's your favorite color, Nick? That's all. It's been all. There are very few that have a life resume, let alone a golf resume, such as the resume of Nick Faldo. He began playing golf in 1971 after watching Jack Nicklaus play the 1971 Masters on television. And what an impression that must have made on a young man playing golf at Wellwyn Garden City Golf Club in England. He turned pro in 1976 at the age of 19. And by the early 1980s, Nick was so good that he was one of the leading players on the European tour. But that wasn't good enough for him. He wanted to win majors. And so, he changed his swing. Did it work? 1987 won the Open Championship by one stroke over Paul Azinger and Roger Davis. 1989 won the Masters in a playoff over Scott Hoke. 1990 won his second consecutive Masters in a playoff over Raymond Floyd. 1990 won his second Open Championship by five strokes over Mark McNulty and Payne Stewart. 1992 won his third Open Championship over John Cook. And in 1996 won his third Masters by five strokes in a final round that we all remember over Greg Norman in 1996. No one won more majors between 1987 and 1996 than Nick. He won three Masters and three Open Championships in that span. Six majors in all, three other PGA Tour titles, and a total of 40 professional wins. He is a member of the Order of the British Empire. Yeah! yeah. Which means he is, and please welcome Sir Nick Faldo. Hang Here we on, go. Hang on, royalty hasn't sat down yet. There we go. Oh, good. Oh, that's not right. See, that's not right. Oh, Nick, I apologize. This is not your normal thread count on the chair. Yeah, uh, I know, exactly. We're, yeah. We're doing the best we can. This is this is lovely. It's a little, uh, little thin on the gold lace, isn't I'm it? Sorry. Yeah. We'll work on that for next year. But we're thrilled that you're here. And actually, Nick said. Please ask me, right off the bat, not what I had planned. He said, please ask me about Fanny Sonnison, my caddy. And ah. there we go. All right. <laughs> you, you, let's start with that. It just can go downhill from there. <laughs> you're, you're, you're giving away all my secrets. Okay. You're, meant, you're meant to feed that in. That's but, why we're yeah, here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we want to uh, hear them. Oh, no way. We, we, oh, wait, we, start, we start the evening with... Uh, 
<laughs> I ho hopefully some of you remember that I, I was one of the first to have a, a professional lady caddy in, in Fanny Sue's Swedish. Yeah, and um, it, was, it was quite, everybody made a big song and dance out of it, but to us it was absolutely fine. We went off, she was a great, very professional. And it, it reminded me of the, um, the very first week we started work was in uh, literally the first weeks of, of January 1990. I, and we flew over to Orlando, to Lake Nona, to start practicing for the start of the season. And I was staying at the club then, in, and Fanny was staying at a hotel down the road, and I unpacked all my stuff, and I realized I'd, I'd lost, left my toothbrush, forgot a toothbrush. So I said to Fanny, could you buy me a toothbrush, you see? So she said, sure. She goes back, and, she said, and then she calls it, what, what type of toothbrush do you want? She said, do you want one with hard bristles or soft bristles? <laughs> Now, some of you get it, it's in England, these are Bristol's, you see. <laughs> so I said, Fanny, I said, you can't, you can't say that, I said, exactly that. I said, these, in Britain, these are Bristol's. She said, oh, you don't want the soft ones then. <laughs> oh. So I thought, we're going to do all right. <laughs> we'll get on fine. How did the two of you meet that, that you that you would hire her for, as your caddy? At, a, at, a, at a, um, a toothbrush salesman's store. There it is. Yeah. And with that, like that. Yeah. <laughs> we move on. Yeah. All right, M many of these kids uh, from the first tee have sports idols that they try to emulate. Can you let us know who was your sports idol growing up and why? Uh, yeah, mine was Bjorn Borg. Uh, was my first guy I watched. And it was, they've just done a fabulous HBO documentary. If you watched that, Bjorg, uh, Macro, how cool was that? I, I got the last... 45 minutes of it just the other the other day um, you know I love the way that he dealt with everything how he was a, such a cool customer and uh, uh, never met him through our ear I only met him um, as you do at Buckingham Palace um, <laughs> quite in um, quite yeah, in night in about 96 or 7 he was playing a, he was playing a charity event at Buckingham Palace with Macaro you know and on the back lawn as one does with you know the majesty <laughs> and so um, I met him finally then and, and then uh, so I quite it's quite fascinating and uh, that man was then I've later learned how physically and mentally strong he was he literally would hit balls all day and then he'd pick up his friends and put them on his shoulder and run around the court you know a hundred times to, to train himself and uh, you know he had he had some amazing mental strength Bjorn yeah. Borg uh, <laughs> what other sports did you play? I played everything and I, I described myself, I was a sportsman looking for a sport. I did everything as, through school and as you said, I then saw uh, the Masters on television um, and probably what struck me more was the colour. I mean, I only got a television when I was eight and I think we got a tele and then we got a colour television when I was 12. Um, and so this was 13 and a quarter. I watched the Masters on TV and thought, wow, this is... And I literally went to my parents, my mum and dad, the next morning. I said, I want to try golf. Knew nothing about it. And my mother says, well, you need a haircut first. <laughs> so she got one of those Fortnum and Mason's, you know, pudding bowls and stuck it on my head and cut around it and, and sent me off to the golf club. And I booked my six lessons with the assistant pro. And, uh, and I, he said, OK. And I said, right, I'm ready. He said, no, you start tomorrow. First lesson's tomorrow. I said, I was, you know, I was ready. I wanted to start. So that's, uh, and then the funny, interesting thing was my then, my next door neighbor gave me two clubs. I didn't have any clubs to, to, gave me a seven and eight iron. And I, and I went off and beat balls and uh, had my six lessons. And then my parents bought me a half set of clubs for my 14th birthday in July. And they were called St. Andrews. Very mm -hmm. interesting. Mm -hmm. And, um, that was it. I played my very first round of golf on my 18th, on my 14th birthday, and an unfortunate thing through that was I'd practiced for three months, so I'd got over, you know, topping it, shanking it, missing it. So actually, I could play. I think I shot 63 or four. No, sorry about Get out 80, of here. 80. Well, I, was just I know I, sh I know I shot in the actually in the low 80s, something like. But I didn't know about. I know I three. I remember, never forget. I three putted the third green. And I said that's stupid. I'd never do that again. And then. <laughs> And I lost three balls, I think, but I didn't know the rules. I didn't know, the, you know, the penalties for that. So, but I know I hit it about 80 times. So it wasn't wasn't bad for first go. And how long did it take for, before the 80s turned into low 70s and 60s? Um, I I think rap, pretty rapidly. You know, a handicap getting cut at 24. I think my first handicap cards I put in, of course, were for about a 12. 
And the club said, oh, no, 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 we've got to put you at starting at 24. It's good for you. <laughs> and uh, fine, 24, 18, and I got down. So I can't, but uh, pretty rapidly, um, the next part of my life was really, I, I, I was bitten. I was 14, by 15, I'd made the decision I want to be a pro golfer. Um, and, I, and I decided well, I wanted to leave school at 16. So that was a way you had to do it in Britain. You wouldn't have scholarships or uni sports you know, opportunities like you have in America. If you wanted to pursue a sporting career, you had to leave school and, and head to the island. And I literally headed to the practice ground and beat balls for a couple of years. Well, you know, I always believe that golf happens in steps, rungs of the ladder, as I call it. And you get different experiences and you certainly climb up. Uh, uh, my very first goal when I got on tour was that was prior to um, any of this world rankings or top whatever. In Britain, it was the top 60 were exempt for the next year. So my, my first goal, I wanted to be in the top 60. So I finished 58th. And then the next year um, was 77. My, my goal that year genuinely was I wanted to make the Ryder Cup team. Um, so, and I did. I finished then, finished eighth in our order of merit, um, winning in the grand total of about eight and a half thousand quid, in about twelve and a half thousand dollars or something, you know. And um, I will send the cat round afterwards for a whip round, you know. So, um, and that was really my big, biggest moment in my life was you know making that Ryder Cup team. I played that at Lytham St Anne's, and in that era we we were in transition of trying to avoid being hammered by you know, the American team. Um, so they only played three matches. They only played one foursomes, one four ball, one singles. Um, just one match a day, because we didn't want to get hammered. Because uh, what happened the, the time before was the match was already over before the Sunday. You know? <laughs> so a little embarrassing for the guys. But um, anyway, I had an unbelievable week. Partnered with Peter Oosterhouse, which is kind of cool that you know, we can still tell those stories together. Um, day one, we played. Um, Ray Floyd and Lou Graham, we were three down off the front nine, and we won that, two and one. Next day, I've got Jack Nicklaus and Ray Floyd. And I'm a 20-year-old kid, and Jack's my idol and everything. That was probably the very first time I've ever spoken to him. I'd watched him play at a few Opens. And so you can imagine, I was petrified. I, and, and the hilarious thing was I, was, I was long in those days. I mean, I had, had won those original you know, Al Dilla, when they first started graphite. And this was like a licorice stick, and it had about seven degrees torque on it. You could literally twist the head around. And I could, with my tempo, I could hit this thing. I hit it 20, 30 yards past Jack. And I never forget standing in a fairway thinking, don't look back, don't look back. He, you know, he's, he's looking, don't look back. <laughs> and so, anyway, I beat, beat Jack and Ray with, with Peter. We beat them two and one. And then the next day, I play Watson, who's the Open champion. And I beat him uh, on the one up. And I never forget because I went up, I was then carted off to do radio and TV. And it was the very first time I'd ever done like radio and TV. And uh, I guess that was the start of, uh, of uh, you know, fame. Yeah. You, I and take it Jack was your idol? Jack, Jack was my idol and he was very inspirational through my career. I mean, the next big moment, um, I played with Jack in about 1983 or something in San Diego. And he shot 63, I shot 71 that felt like 81. And I walked, came away and I thought, how did he do that? He, it was so easy. I, you know, I didn't get it. And about two, and then it clicked how he played. And he talked later to how he could shape the ball and make, you know, if the pin was on the left, he hit it in the middle of the green and just tipped it. Call it, we call it tipping it rather than shaping it, you know, just turn it. So if it, if it came off, obviously it was close. If it didn't come off, it was in the middle of the green. If he did anything drastic, maybe it's on the other side of the green. Get me? So his margin of error, he never really missed greens left or right. And I worked that out. That's when I started to work on my swing and wanted to shape, learn to shape the ball. And uh, um, it didn't work. <laughs> so, and it's quite funny because I was at Muirfield Village in 1985 and I just missed a cut. I couldn't play it. I was lost. And that's when I met David Ledbetter and kind of, I'd actually met David before, but he was there that week. I said, right, I'm ready. Uh, throw the book at me, and he did. And uh, two years later, I closed the book. You know, I, I literally rebuilt my swing over, I used to hit the, you know, I used to hit five buckets of ball a day, five buckets of balls a day. But they were the big buckets. You know, the ones that got 300 balls in? Oh my. I tell you, yeah. I, Your I hands? Was, 
Your my back. Ha- I used, my <laughs> hands were used to bleed. I, I used to get to the end of the day, I couldn't close my hands, you know. And then I'd go off and go for a swim at three o'clock or something, to, and then I'm sure like, like an idiot, I'll be back at six o'clock and hit mm-hmm. a few more. A li- the biggest one for amateurs, club members, is alignment. That is the one that, you know, I play, obviously we played the dreaded Pro-Am every week for 35 years. And, 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 I, and it used to amuse me. Well, I, I, you know, I made, helped it amuse me because, you know, the guy would hit it straight right in the trees and I'd say, good shot. Mm-hmm. You know, why not? You know? <laughs> and then I, I'd you know, rearrange, rearrange my jaw and I'd say, well, that was the way you're aiming, you idiot. You know, exactly. <laughs> so... How can I help you? And so and that was number one, where amateurs haven't got a clue where they're aiming. That's, number, that's really number one. And then the other one is swallow your pride because you cannot hit a 7-9-195, okay? <laughs> and the funniest thing would be you go and play a par three, it'd be 195, and the guy would say, oh, I'll play a par three at my home course, and it's 195, and I always hit a 7-9. I said, well, which is where it's down the mountain and this one's going that way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, that's we go. My best, here we go, my story. Oh, true, 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 true. Play, I went to, you know, Flint, Pro-Am, first hole, playing with his three ball, four ball. Old boy, seriously, he's over 80, takes a 10 up the first. I think, ah, oh, damn it, I've got to be nice to him. I've got to give him a lesson, try and be, try and be helpful. So we're in the middle of the second fairway. And I said, now what you've got to do is you've got to try and get your weight over onto your right side. I said, you've got, you know, so I'm trying to show him this. He's, he said, well, I'm having problems because my hip, I've had hip replacement in, and it's, and it's stiff, it's stuck, and I can't get the weight over. I said, all right, don't worry about that. So I said, well, when you get to the top, then you've got to turn, you've got to pull with the left shoulder. He said, well, I've got one of those new titanium, <laughs> titanium. Honest, true as I sit here, I've got a titanium rotator cuff fitted. Right here, I said, it's, and it's chilly, it's cold, and I can't get the thing to go. I said, all right, okay, don't worry about that. I said, well, try then, try your best to just keep your eye on the ball, just watch the ball as you go through impact. He says, well, I've picked up the wrong glass, I've got the Weiss bifocals. He says, and he said, I can't focus. I said, apart from that, everything's okay. And he went, pardon? <laughs> golf joke. Favorite golf joke. Yeah, the, um, the, um, the lady calls the police station. Uh, no, sorry, the guy calls the... Who, who calls the police station? The guy calls the police station. And says, uh, I murdered just... I think you better come around. He said, well, what's up? I've murdered a wife. Oh, OK. So the um, guy arrives at the front door and uh, the officer says, uh, can I help you? He says, yes, uh, I've uh, murdered a wife. He said, OK, I'll... He says, I'll, uh, I'll, make, a, I'll make a note of that. Mur- murdered the wife and he says can I can I come in he says just wanders in he wanders in in the land there's golf balls and clubs lying oh play a bit of golf do we search you do it plays plays golf what's your handicap he says well I'm a 14 he says, oh yeah I'm very nice friend. and where do you play he says well I play at Ronamick oh do we we play at Ronamick oh, right, yeah. I play at the Muni down the road he says so make a note of that he says, so where's the uh, the body he says in the kitchen okay we're going to make the kitchen make a note and he goes in there and she's lying dead on the floor so he says so what happened well, she was unfaithful to me. Well, all right, I'm unfaithful. He says, so how did, you, how did you kill her? He said, well, I, I hit her with my golf clubs. Oh, hit her with clubs. What did you hit her with? He said, well, I hit her with a three-wood, three-iron, nine, six-iron, nine-iron, a putter. So oh, three-wood, three-iron, six-iron, nine-iron. He says, how many times you hit her? He says, oh, I don't know, 12, 13, 14. He said, I'll put you down for a five. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Nick Baldo, everybody. Sir Nick Baldo. I like that. Uh, you're like Benny Hill, and I love <laughs> Benny Hill. You're amazing. Um, we have questions. Put up your hand. We'll get a microphone to you. In, over there, toward, uh, toward the left. Towards the left. Toward the left. Toward the light. light. Go ahead. Okay. Um, my uh, my brother had the the fortunate opportunity to be sitting with Jack Nicklaus during the British Open in his uh, in his office, glass of scotch, and they called the British Open due to too much wind. And oh, just recently, yeah, just recently, just yeah, I recently. was there. Yes. and uh, and Jack hopped up out of his seat and said a few choice words, and I immediately was thinking, 
what's Nick Faldo thinking about calling the, the British? Well, I they... will have my choice words would be stuff Jack Nicklaus because I was out there. <laughs> <laughs> God, I was out there that Friday afternoon. It blew 40, a genuine 40, and everything was shaking and he didn't know whether it was you or the clubs or the ball. Um, it was brutal. It was impossible to play golf. And, then... and so... Uh, it was on the it obviously went over the limit and we were called off the golf course we sat around the corner and and, and uh it was quite funny because we <laughs> our the driver in our van could could was on the same radio frequency as the rna making the decision to you know where we should well i say gordon i think we should put him back out there <laughs> and then go and go and uh no actually gordon said well you know so, you know somebody like that said well i think we should put him out this well okay chaps we all agree gordon said put him back down there so <laughs> so if some poor guy got the decision and back we went back we went you know we went out on the golf you, you couldn't chip you couldn't part guys on the six was a fifth green you know when you arrive to the front of the fifth green you see guys going up and back and up and back and then the 13th holds it so it yeah, it was impossible, yeah.